Bonsoir et bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Uh, bonsoir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, can I have your attention? Uh, bonsoir uh, et bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Uh, je suis Lisa Shapiro, la doyenne de la Faculté des Arts à McGill uh, University. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the inaugural McGill Max Bell Major Policy Lectures. As we begin, I want to recognize that McGill University is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill acknowledges and thanks the diverse indigenous peoples whose, president, whose presence has enriched this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. It's great to see so many people here tonight to listen to a discussion about climate change and economic policy, and it is quite a full house tonight, which is great to see. Canada faces many challenges um, that are primarily economic in nature. To help address these challenges, the Max Bell School of Public Policy has initiated this new lecture series, the focus of which is to discuss and debate key issues in economic policy. The subtitle of the McGill Max Bell policy, Major Policy Lecture Series is Economic Ideas for a Stronger Canada. And tonight is an opportunity to contribute to this objective. The format of this series is worth drawing attention to. As I mentioned at the outset, this is the third of three lectures, each held in a different Canadian city, Calgary, Ottawa, and here in Montreal. And each event is not simply a lecture, but also the beginning of a discussion led by a distinguished speaker about a challenge of economic policy, engaged by an experienced policy practitioner, and continuing conversation with audience members. This format of substantive and open exchange, bringing together policy theorists, practitioners, and a wider public is representative of the Max Bell School of Public Policy here at McGill. These lectures have been made possible by a generous gift from Tom Kierens, a proud McGill alumnus and prominent name for many years in Canadian business and Canadian public policy including heading up for many years one of Canada's most influential policy think tanks, the C.D. Howe Institute. And unfortunately, Tom Kierens um, is unable to be with us here this evening. Um, but Tom has another McGill connection worth mentioning. His father, Eric Kierens, was a McGill professor in the early 1960s before he began his successful political career, both in Quebec City and in Ottawa. Tom Kierens and his wife, Mary Janigan, unfortunately could not join us this evening, but they will be able to take advantage of the recording of tonight's lecture and the discussion that follows. I'd like to express my very sincere thanks to them for their vision and for their generosity. So much of what happens in universities like ours is only possible through the genera generosity of benefactors, and the Ma Max Bell School is delighted to have their support for this set of lectures. I'd like now to introduce Chris Reagan, the director of the Max Bell School, to discuss the theme of this year's lectures and to introduce our special guests. Chris, over to you. Bonsoir à tous et bienvenue. Thank you, Lisa. The Max Bell School launched to the public in 2017, and since then we have been building many things, including an intensive and innovative Master of Public Policy program, and you'll meet many of our students here tonight, research centers, policy boot camps for journalists, partnerships with think tanks, and public events on various policy topics. This major set of lectures on economic policy is our latest creation, and I'm delighted that we have successfully made it to tonight's venue with no major mishap. And we, of course, had the first installment of these lectures in Ottawa on October 19th, and the second one last week, October 25th, in Calgary. The vision of these lectures, and Lisa gave you a little bit of it, but I will give you a little bit more. The vision of these lectures is to highlight a crucial policy issue for the Canadian economy, and especially one that we either aren't thinking about enough or perhaps aren't thinking clearly enough about. <clears throat> 
In addition, it is to provide a platform for a policy thinker who is not yet a household name, even among households which discuss policy. There will be three lectures each year, one in Montreal, one in a city in Western Canada, and a third one in a city that somehow aligns with the topic. Finally, the vision is to ensure that each year the central ideas are contained in a book that is written in a manner that makes the policy issue accessible to normal people. Now, I must admit that it took me about 25 years to truly recognize that economists are not normal people. So that's actually not so easy. On this point, by the way, I want to extend a sincere thanks to Ken White, whose Sutherland House uh, will be, did publish the book that's in your hand and will be publishing the books in future years. His immediate enthusiasm for this project was very heartening, and he, like many boys born in Edmonton, is a pleasure to work with. Le thème de ces conférences est le changement climatique et la politique climatique. Nous en avons certainement beaucoup discuté au Canada au cours des dernières années, mais à mon avis, nous n'en avons pas discuté aussi sérieusement ou de manière aussi productive que nous ne pourrions et le devrions. Il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. In 1945, Hugh McLennan wrote a novel called Two Solitudes, a book about the perceived inabilities to communicate between Francophones and Anglophones, and by extension between Quebec and Canada. These two solitudes may still exist, but they aren't nearly as stark as they were then, or even in the 1980s, or even 1995, neither in Quebec nor in Canada. Aujourd'hui, je pense que le Canada a deux nouvelles solitudes au sujet des débats sur les changements climatiques et la politique climatique. Quels sont-ils? Around Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto, it is easy to find people who believe strongly that climate change is a problem and that we and our governments need to act aggressively. Many of these people also believe that fossil fuels are essentially immoral and that it is inconceivable that a federal government claiming to care about climate change could purchase the TMX pipeline and expand its capacity. They want to shut down Canada's oil patch as soon as possible. At the other end of the country, and especially in Alberta and Saskatchewan, it is easy to find people who acknowledge the seriousness of climate change, but who worry a lot about Canadian climate policy. In particular, they view aggressive Canadian carbon pricing and other emissions reducing regulations as a threat to the significant income generated every day in the oil patch. They see little sense in denying ourselves this benefit, especially since Canada is such a small part of the global climate problem. I think both of these solitudes are incorrect. Climate change is real and Canada needs to do its part in this global collective action problem. I also think the aggressive Canadian policies can make an important difference and that if they are designed appropriately, they do not need to threaten Canada's oil patch. But I am the first to admit that this view is not easy to communicate and that our federal government has not done a great job on that front. And this week's decision by the federal government has simply added to those communications challenges. That may come up tonight in the question and answer period. Given the importance and urgency of this issue and the need to get Canada's policies right, it was obvious to me over a year ago how we needed to kick off the McGill Max Bell lectures. Andrew Leach is one of the few Canadian economists who knows climate policy as well as he knows energy policy. And he knows that in Canada, at least, we cannot talk sensibly about one without considering the other. He is a master of bridging the particular rigors of academia with those of practical policymaking. He knows how to write for, uh, and despite the fact that he's an accomplished academic economist, he knows how to write for and talk to normal people. He learned that sooner than I did. His is a rare collection of skills, and he is exactly the person we need to kick off these inaugural McGill Max Bell lectures. Andrew spoke in Ottawa on October 19th about the challenges of promising a just transition to those workers who will be negatively affected by an energy transition. He was in Calgary on October 25th speaking about how long we can realistically expect to continue supplying the world with Canadian oil. I think it is fair to say that both messages were fairly humbling to the respective audiences. Tonight, 
Andrew is completing his assignment by giving his third and final talk in the series on the question of whether Canada's cold temperatures mean that we can take a less aggressive policy response to climate change. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andrew Leach to deliver tonight's McGill Max Bell Lectures. Andrew fera ses commentaires en anglais et la conversation qui, qui suivra sera également en anglais, mais n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions en français si vous voulez. Andrew? Merci, Chris. Merci à vous tous. C'est un plaisir d'être de retour à Montréal où j'ai commencé ma carrière académique à HEC Montréal, à l'autre côté de la montagne. Thanks to the Max Bell team, uh, particularly to Adriana and Weston, who you saw at the front entrance, who've made these events possible. Thanks to the donors, of course, for the vision for these lectures. And thanks to Ken White and the team at Sutherland House, who put these beautiful books uh, in your hands. And since we're here at McGill, I'm going to take a couple of minutes for an extra special thank you um, to two research assistants who played a very large role in the production of this book, to Vivian Allison and Jimmy Beltran, who are, were MPP students here at McGill and who Chris assigned to the unenviable task of helping me develop this book. And it sounds like an exaggeration to say this book would not exist without them, but it's not. They played an integral role in every part of the research, the scoping of ideas, the development of arguments, the editing of copy under incredible time pressure when some of their own work was at risk. So I really do want to carve out time, especially since some of their professors and colleagues are in the room, uh, to thank and highlight them. Um, so a little over a year ago, Chris pitched this idea to me, and it went something like this. I'd like you to give these lectures. And I said, yes. And he said, and you have to write a book. And I said, oh. And so any of you who have attempted to write a book, you will appreciate the idea that perhaps doing so in a little less than a year, thank you, Ken, for the one-month extension, um, is a very challenging task. And I had to sit and think, what is it that I want to tell Canadians about climate change with this platform? And I thought a lot about really niche economics ideas and cool results and some graphs I could make and everybody would be really excited about. And then I thought, as Chris said, no, normal people. What is it that I want them to hear? And it really comes down to four words, or if my friend Eric Adams, a McGill alum, had his way, um, it would be five words without the contraction. But it's really not that simple. This is a message I wanted to get across to you that the way we talk to ourselves about climate change is based a lot on what I started calling little lies of the, about climate change, little lies that we tell ourselves. And then I changed that to little lies, easy sound bites, half truths, and there were a few other things about climate change, and Ken said, okay, we need a different title. But you can imagine that the title all the way along was the little lies we tell ourselves about climate change. And too often that's where we start as Canadians. And so I picked six that I wanted to take on in this book. And that list isn't exhaustive, but I do think it captures some of the major themes that we often see around our discussion. If you open that lovely book to the table of contents, you'll see my list of six. And probably many of them are very familiar. And in fact, a couple of them came up uh, during the opening tonight. We only account for 2% of global emissions. Do our actions really matter? One of my personal favorites, well, solar and wind don't work because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. Um, and, you know, the one that's very popular in, in my home province of Alberta, even if the world acts on climate change, well, we'll still use oil and gas. That one's helpfully usually accompanied by like a picture of a toothbrush or an iPhone or some reminder that we use oil and gas for things other than cars. Um, but tonight, I do want to talk about what for me was the most interesting, most challenging and most enlightening chapter of the book. And it was to take on the soundbite that Canada's a cold country, so we'll, ben we'll benefit or we won't um, suffer that much from climate change. And I opened chapter three in the book uh, with a quote from Canada's former finance and natural resources minister, Joe Oliver. And in that quote, it's really a typical example of, a, of the type. Um, he quotes a study from Moody's that concludes that Canada will benefit from climate change. And in typical Joe Oliver, National Post fashion, he's very excited to tell us all, to scold us all for our lack of common sense about this question. And with a little bit of a nod to irony, or lack of a nod to irony, he sees a warming climate as an opportunity for more oil and gas development in Canada's Arctic. So 
probably many of you nod, you hear Joe Oliver and climate change and you're tempted to write that off because you know where he stands on the subject. But that's not a fun chapter to write. What makes this a fun chapter to write is the fact that there is a lot of truth in the studies that Joe Oliver is citing. These are not studies that simply appear in the pages of reports from right-wing think tanks or oil and gas companies. These are studies that appear in some of our top academic journals, Nature, Climate Change, Plus One, et cetera, that come up with the very consistent result that if you rank global countries in terms of their exposure to the cost of climate change, Canada comes out near the bottom of the cost or in many cases as a potential beneficiary of climate change. And that's always been a challenge to me since I first started studying these topics um, at Queen's actually as a, as a PhD student in economics. So with these papers in mind, is Joe Oliver right? Are we in this position where as Canadians will benefit from climate change? No. Um, and if you're thinking that something's missing from these studies, you're right. And it fits in with a pattern of other topics that I address in the book. So in the book, I take on a lot of what Dan Kahneman calls the availability heuristic. This idea that when we're faced with a challenging question, we like to sort of subconsciously pivot to an easier question that we're happier with the answer. So the one that's popular in my home province, when faced with the question of will climate change disrupt the oil and gas industry, we don't answer that question. We answer easier ones like will the world continue to use oil and gas or will Canada's oil sands produce the last barrel of oil anywhere in the world? Irrelevant to the overall question, but much easier to answer. And this is another one of those subjects. Um, so let me get to, back to those studies. It's not the studies themselves that are flawed, it's that the methods don't give an answer to the really hard question that we're actually asking here. So statistically, what are these studies asking? They're asking whether, based on historical data, Canada has done well relative to how it would be expected to do in an average year when the world is also experiencing average climatic conditions. Um, I've got to be careful about my econometrics with Professor Russell Davidson in the room. But um, they are asking a slightly different question than one which would be, how is Canada going to fare in a sequence of increasing warmer than average years, when each year would be expected to be warmer than the last and warmer than the trailing long-term average. And so in asking that subtly different question, they come to an answer that while statistically correct, really doesn't apply to the question they purport to be asking. And that's what I think makes this work really interesting. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. So let's take a step back and frame where is Canada in terms of its climate change position right now. So Canada up to 2021 has warmed, depending on whose numbers you use and whose averages you use, but roughly two degrees Celsius from our 1950s average. But more importantly, perhaps, nine of Canada's 10 warmest years ever, in our records at least, so we're see, um, have occurred in the last decade. And temperatures have increased here, as scientists would have predicted, more than twice as quickly as they, they increase for the global average. And if you go to northern Canada, that number moves from two to three times faster than the global average. Um, so that's a starting point. And then regardless of what the world does to act on climate change, those changes and significant further changes are already locked in. Um, because of the stock of greenhouse gas emissions that we've put into the atmosphere, those increasing temperatures will continue for years and decades to come regardless of our near-term actions on climate change. So we, all of us here, are going to live the rest of our lives in a profoundly changed climate. Um, the question is, how bad will it get? Now, the most obvious consequence of climate change is the one that's right there in the old term global warming. Things are going to get dramatically warmer. And with that, we're going to have more risk of extreme heat events and extreme heat waves. An event like the 2021 heat dome in BC, that extreme heat event, is substantially more likely, it's actually made possible by the climate change that we've endured sort of from 1950 to now. In the absence of climate change, an event like that is all but impossible. 
put that there, and I'll probably knock it over, but we'll try not to. And as global temperatures get warmer, and our local temperatures get warmer, events like that become more and more likely. They're not certain, they're never guaranteed, but they become substantially more likely. So what we've seen to date is only just the beginning. Along with that, somewhat paradoxically, climate change brings us both the risks of more rain and large rainfall events and more flooding, but it also brings us the risk, particularly in the prairies, of more drought conditions. So these are the types of conditions that come with climate change that would not necessarily be just predicated on a war, or just expected to occur in any given warmer than average year. So you can start to see how I'm building the narrative here. That if the studies are asking you how do we do in a warmer than average year, the question is are these events that would happen in a warmer than average year? Perhaps, but they become far more likely, far more severe, and far more damaging in a world, um, in a climate changed world. And these sustained temperature increases, other than the obvious uh, extreme weather events, flooding, droughts, etc., uh, they also lead to a lot of cumulative effects that we would definitely not associate uh, with a warmer than average year. And it's those that I want to talk about for the balance of my remarks tonight, and it's those events that I hope you'll agree cast extreme doubt on that link between will Canada do warmer and will do better in a warmer than average year, you know, farmers are happy, a little longer growing season, a little more productivity, maybe better tourism, versus the sustained impacts of climate change over time. So let's look a little bit deeper, and I detail these in the book, and so I'm trying to find a, a sweet spot that I can talk through some of these for you tonight. But some of the events that we would associate with sustained climate change that you wouldn't associate with an individual warmer than average year. Now let's start up north, and let's start with frozen land and water. So when you think about the north, probably you think about snow and ice, but you don't think a lot about the ground. But the ground is important because we rely on frozen ground or permafrost in about 50% of Canada's land area. And that permafrost is not just about frozen ground making it hard to dig, it's the iron, steel, and concrete of our northern communities. Houses, roads, airports, infrastructure, pipelines, etc., tailings ponds, that's the terrifying one, are all supported and based on the continued existence of that frozen ground. Northern Canada is literally built on permafrost. And permafrost thaw is going to be, is already a consequence of our warming climate. We're already seeing the effects. We can adapt to some degree, but having all of, think of if all of our concrete suddenly started to turn to dust. I gotta be careful with those jokes in Montreal. But uh, it, were that to happen, you can sort of understand that things might be challenging. Homes, businesses, et cetera, need to be rebuilt in areas where it's already very expensive and very challenging to live. And we've only seen the beginning of that. Now, let's take a move out to the frozen water. Let's move off the frozen land and the frozen water and think of sea ice as, um, oh, sorry, I should have said one more thing on the, on the frozen land before we get to frozen water. Um, how do we access many of our northern communities? We access them by winter ice roads. That's how we get supplies and fuel in, people out, availability of more experiences. And as the warming happens over time, the operating seasons for those roads get shorter. Yes, a warmer than average year shortens the life of that road. But as we get warmer and warmer over time, you get shorter average seasons, you get more seasons with very short road access, which then makes it more expensive or impossible to do the work that you would want to do in those communities. Um, turn to sea ice. So I put a graph in the book, I think one of the first ones is the collapse of Arctic sea ice. But sea ice is essential to the way of life in the north and essential to reducing the effects of climate change because of the degree to which it affects the energy, reflects the energy from the sun back into space as opposed to absorbing it in the oceans. So Arctic sea ice is receding at a rate of 12% per year right now. And we're expecting that by the year 2050, we're gonna see our first ice-free summer in the Arctic. So, uh, but maybe more importantly and less well recognized is the change in the age of the ice. And I have that graph in the book where we show that most of the ice that's remaining in the Arctic is seasonal young ice, which tends to be more variable, move around more with weather patterns, which means that for traditional ways of life, you can't count on it for fishing, 
polar bear habitats are changing, the ability for it to support wildlife. I have to be careful, Jerry, to talk about polar bears and such with uh, former WWF CEO here, but I think that uh, it, it is certainly an important part of our changing landscape in response to the frozen, frozen uh, northern landscapes. Um, but it's not just the ice, it's the water. So climate change, as it melts polar ice caps and as the seas warm and expand, we are already seeing substantial sea level rise, and we're going to continue to see more of that over time. 25 centimeters to date, with the significant possibility of 75, to a, 75 centimeters to a meter of sea level rise affecting most of Canada's coastlines by the end of this century. So start to think about what that changes. Now, the good news, for sea level rise at least, is we can see it coming and it happens very slowly. So for the people as old as me in this audience, that scene from Austin Powers with the steamroller, you can see it coming. All you need to do is react to it. But reacting to it is nowhere near as easy as it sounds. And in the book, I quote from some of the planning that's going on in Canadian municipalities. For example, the city of Delta, that's looking at what on earth do we do with the fact that so much of our land sits below what will eventually be the new high tide line. You're seeing this all over the world. It's not just Canada. Miami is a primary example right now. And in, among those responses, they talk about things like raising infrastructure like hospitals and schools, above the existing low tide lines or buffering them with seawalls um, and dikes. This is not something that you do in a single warmer than average year. Right? This is a response to that sustained climate change over time. Um, and just as our, our lands and our northern, northern lands and oceans will change, our forests will change a lot as well. Um, and probably the hardest part of writing this chapter was that I was writing, the, this will tell you how short this short notice this was, but I was writing the chapter right at the time when the 2023 wildfire season really took off in Western Canada. So, you know, for Quebec, obviously it got much more serious later on in the summer, but in April and May in Alberta, it felt like everything was catching fire. We had three or four fires on a daily basis for a couple of weeks within the city of Edmonton along our highways. At my house, we actually sat down and said, okay, do we need, and we're right in downtown Edmonton, but we live next to a forested ravine. Now, do we need an action plan? Do we need an evacuation bag? What do we do if there is a fire in the ravine? It got really close to home. Now, luckily, the fire stayed away from us, but tens of thousands of people were displaced from their homes, sometimes for months at a time, not just in Alberta, but obviously in BC and the Northwest Territories and communities in Quebec, et cetera. Um, people were displaced um, all over this country. And it was an eerie reminder, at least for me, of that, uh, you know, the wildfire in Lytton in 2021, uh, in particular, the McMurray Fire of 2016, the Slave Lake Fire of 2011, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and John Valen's book this summer, Fire Weather, was also on my desk as I was writing this chapter. But he had an op-ed in the Globe and Mail, which I try to read the quote, and every time I, I can barely read it because of how real it gets. But he writes, and I've got it here on my notes, in Fort McMurray in May 2016, the temperature broke the record high for that day by six degrees, and it was drier than Death Valley. For fire, that's as good as gasoline. But if you remember watching those, the footage of people fleeing the suburbs of Fort McMurray um, and those, the, the areas of Fort McMurray that I know quite well, I've been up there a lot, it was absolutely terrifying. And I've been up there a few times since and where you see how the fire ravaged right into the, basically the core of the city within sight of downtown. Um, yeah, I get chills when I read that quote and I think we all should. And these are not effects that we can easily adapt to. And here's, what this, here's where it gets scary. That fire weather that, I'll use uh, John's terminology for it, that drove that fire in Fort McMurray, the research says that we're in line for probably 15 more days of that type of weather every single year in the years to come. Now, I don't know about you, this summer was not any fun. And I'm not lined up for 15 more days of that type of fear, evacuation, and heartbreaking images of people fleeing their homes. But it's not just the fire, it's the smoke. So in Edmonton, uh, we had 299 hours that were defined as smoke hours this year. That broke our previous record of 229, that was from 2018. Um, Regina, Saskatoon, a lot of communities on the prairie set similar records. But I want to tell you about Calgary. So Calgary, 
Before 2014, they had never seen more than 100 hours of smoke, and that's defined by the amount of visibility loss that you get. They'd never seen more than 100 hours of smoke um, in a year before 2014. So this past year, they had 482 hours that met that threshold for what Environment Canada calls a smoke hour. Their previous record was 450 in 2018. So the curve looks like that. Chris, I promised you I'd do at least one graph with my hand during each of these lectures. I think that was in our contract, so done. Um, and you know, warmer than average years do increase wildfire risks, but not to the same degree as that sustained warming that pushes our baseline up and pushes those extreme heat and low humidity events. I could go on, but you don't want me to do that. I could talk about ticks carrying Lyme disease. I could talk about forest pests, um, pine beetles, etc. I could talk about poisonous snakes. Um, you probably don't want me to do that. Right now, in most parts of the country, we're not beating up too much on Lethbridge, Alberta, but the poisonous snakes are kept south of us by the mere fact that we're a cold country. And a lot of those other pests um, insect-borne diseases, et cetera, we are protected from a lot of them by the fact that we're a cold country. But beyond a single warmer than average year, a sustained climate change, you're gonna see those effects more and more. And if you wanna see it visually, think of flying or driving through the mountains in Western Canada and seeing the pine beetle infestation. You can see the, climate, the effect of climate change right there in front of you. So I think I've made my point. If you study a warmer than average year, you're not going to get a sense of what Canada looks like in a climate changed world. But that last word, the world, is the other piece that's omitted from these studies. Statistically, what they're assuming, and it's basic econometrics, is they're assuming a look at Canada with a deviation from its historic average during a time period where the world is experiencing average conditions and no interaction between what happens to the world and what happens to Canada. Um, they tend to omit the fact that we don't exist in isolation, that what climate change drives globally will affect our shores. So what they should be asking is not, how will Canada do in a warmer year? They should be asking, how will Canada do in a warmer world? And what they're gonna find is a prediction of a warmer and more vol volatile Canada in a warmer and more volatile world. We can't duck the consequences of climate change. So think of all the things I just talked about for Canada, droughts, flooding events, et cetera, and imagine how those affect, in particular, the global south. And the consequences of that will be stark. They will be regime instability. They will be um, food insecurity. They will lead to a continuation and amplification of the migration that we've seen globally. Um, I read an email from uh, Jerry's uh, Eurasia group uh, a couple weeks ago that talked about a billion people being displaced by the impacts of climate change around the world. And I think that's becoming now um, the consensus estimate. So if you look at how, in the book I quote the US Defense Department or our Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and the degree of a threat that climate change prevents to global security and thus to our national security and our prosperity, it is really sobering. And punchline coming again, that's not the impact of Canada in a warmer than average year getting a slightly longer growing season. So the fact that we're cold does offer us some protection from the worst of climate change. You know, Joe Oliver is not wrong in the sense that, well, if it were a couple of degrees warmer, all else equal, most of us, not the northern Canadians, but most of us might be a little more comfortable. But that all else equal is not what is offered to us from climate change. Climate change offers us, as I said, a more volatile Canada in a much, much more volatile world. And I mentioned the snakes, right? We covered the snakes. Um, so we shouldn't take solace in these studies that suggest that Canada will be better off uh, or even not that badly off from climate change. The omissions from all of these studies that make for the convenient little lies and sound bites that go with them um, should give us pause and should turn us to asking how can we solve this problem. They should turn us to push for more global mitigation. Now in the book I challenge the question of, well, shouldn't we just adapt? Can't we just adapt to these things? And I think one of the nice connections between this chapter and that chapter is that all of these things that I've mentioned are nearly impossible for us to collectively adapt to. But more importantly, 
the climate math argues against adaptation because your instinct might be, well, we can adapt to sea level rise. We can adapt and change some of the ways we, we live, et cetera. But start thinking about everybody in the world doing that. Add them up one after the other, after the other, after the other. That's one alternative. The other is to act to mitigate those emissions. And when you mitigate those emissions, you save the costs here and here and here and here. Does that count as a graph with my hands too? Are we good? Um, okay, I just wanna make sure I got that, that one covered. Um, so I think adaptation alone is a false economy. In almost every case, mitigation is going to have to play a key role in our response to global climate change. The only way to mitigate most of the effects I've talked about today is to be a part of mitigating them for everybody. Now, while some might say, and I address this in the book as well, that we're only 2% of global emissions, what difference can we make? That shouldn't stop us from doing our part. In fact, the fact that we are a larger than, you know, pro rata share of both the history of creating the problem and of continuing to exacerbate the problem should be part and parcel of our motivation for action. Now, I open the book by saying that climate change is the environmental, economic, and societal challenge of our time. And I think we owe it to ourselves not to rely on easy sound bites, little lies, um, and half-truths like Canada's a cold country, so we'll be okay. I can't be more excited to wrap up these lectures with the opportunity to talk to uh, my old friend Jerry Butts about these issues and to let you also benefit from his insight on, in, into these issues as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Chris. Look forward to talking with you, and uh, thanks again for being here. So I thought Ottawa and Calgary were sobering discussions. This is a fairly sobering discussion. Um, but that's exactly why we're here, to talk about these issues. So Andrew, thank you very much. Lots to think about. I'd like to now introduce Gerald Butts, uh, currently the Vice Chair of the Eurasia Group, uh, an international consulting firm. Prior to this position, Jerry was several things, not all at once. He was Principal Secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for several years. Before that, he headed up the World Wildlife Fund in Canada. Before that, he was the Principal Secretary to Ontario Premier Dalton McGuinty. And before that, of course, he was a proud McGill student. Jerry Butts knows a lot about politics, policy, and climate change, so he is the perfect person to be with, here, with us here tonight. He has kindly agreed to interview Andrew for about the next 40 minutes. Uh, and after that, we'll open up for questions from the audience. So, Jerry, thank you very much. Packed house. Yeah. The last time I was in this room, by the way, welcome to McGill, Andrew. Um, the last time I was in this room, I was standing on a stage with Ken Dryden. So you've got some uh, stiff competition. He only was my childhood hero. He managed to do a few things while he was a student here at McGill as well. So That's not even fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't top that. I, I, I'm going to embarrass you before I begin with questions. Uh, when you're, I've done two, as Chris said, I've done two tours of duty in government, one in our largest province and one in the prime minister's office, and worked on campaigns at both levels. Uh, for them over the course of 12 years. I've spent about half my life in politics and public service. And um, one of the things you learn really quickly is you go into uh, politics and especially government, you better have a full intellectual gas tank because you do nothing but drain it the whole time you're in there. And the only thing that really keeps you um, uh, abreast of the latest and greatest in whatever field, public policy field you have to be working in, is people like Andrew. And they are too, uh, f they're too few and far between in this country. And in particular, over the past uh, 10, 15 years, there's been a vilification of expertise throughout society. Um, but in particular, and I think this is a strategic move, um, those who do not want to see fact, reason, science injected into public policy debate, attack people like Andrew um, in this social media age. And I know there are other people in the room who've put up with it. I've certainly put up with it myself because I signed up for it. Uh, but academics who engage in public policy should not have to put up with it. Uh, 
and it's a statement of this man's character as well as his um, expertise that he did for the greater good of the country, and I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for it and encourage you to continue to do it. No cup rings, though. No cup <laughs> rigs. No, unfortunately, there's no Stanley Cup parade. It does not proceed along the usual route, yeah. as they say here in Montreal. Um, so I want to start by painting a picture for people, Andrew. This is, uh, I'll take you back to early November uh, 2015. And we had just won the election, which was a surprise to many that the Trudeau government was elected in 2015, in particular with a majority government. We started the campaign in third place, ended up winning a majority government. And uh, the thing that I was most excited about, and frankly it was the reason I got involved in the first place, was the opportunity to shape a more uh, coherent and effective climate policy for the country. And the first people we talked to about it were, and I, maybe this was the first time we met in person. No, we'd met before that. before that were uh, Andrew Leach, Richard Discerny, and Brian Topp, a bunch of McGill grads there. Uh, we had dinner together in Ottawa, and we talked about what the Notley government, which had itself just been elected that spring, was planning on climate and how we could make that cohere with what we were planning. And I want to ask you, Andrew, um, what has happened since then? <laughs> and, well, and, and, and you're not going to ask me to write another book, are you? No, I, this is Chris's secret mission in getting me to do yeah. this interview. Has, if you were to rate it where zero is, zero is totally negative, 10 is totally positive, how would you judge the intervening uh, five, eight years it's been? Holy smokes. Uh, and if you could go back, and not just in your own um, uh, impact on public policy, but wide berth to judge others, uh, what would you change? Um, so the first time I met with Chris, so for those that don't know, I helped Premier Notley design the Alberta climate policy. So when um, Prime Minister Trudeau was elected, we were basically weeks from announcing a policy framework that we'd already largely developed. And the premise of that was how do we take Alberta from a position of a climate laggard, and in some ways analogous to how Canada is on the global stage, to one that could be a credible actor and could credibly say we're part of the solution to the problem. And this is not, Chris did not pay me to say this, but in our, in our world the solution was prices, not quantities. It was put a price on carbon and say we are acting on this in a very transparent way, in a way that's more aggressive than most other locations in the world. Um, so the first thing I said to not, Premier Notley then was, I think we need to go with carbon pricing. Um, her reaction was initially not that positive, but we got there. But the second thing I told her was that if you take what you know is, I think, the right approach to this problem, the challenge will be that there'll be seven people who'll be happy with it. And I picked the word, the number seven. I remember this conversation very precisely. And I said, you know, you'll introduce this policy. People will be very happy with it. But very quickly, there'll be those who say, okay, well, what have you done since last week? And there'll be those who say, well, you know, that was too far. And that, that that middle will shrink very, very rapidly. And I think we've watched that happen in Alberta. We've watched that happen federally as well. That, you know, the, the policies that are in place today, I don't think anyone would have dreamed of them in, you know, if you would have come out in 2014 and said, Alberta's gonna be off coal by 2024. Federal government's going to have a national carbon price going to $170 a ton by 2030. We're going to have federal off-coal regulations. We're going to have federal clean fuels regulations. We're going to have, you know, an Alberta solar boom that's so serious that the government has to stop in and, like, the premier has to throw herself in front of the solar installers and say, please stop now. Like, I would never have expected we were going to have that. But other side of it is we're still having conversations that sound like they're in 2005, where you know solar is a hoax, and I, I think the principal secretary to the premier called it a hoax perpetrated by the Germans, um, or a scam perpetrated by the Germans. I We're it was still Chinese. No the Germans. Record. Germans. Um, Chinese are in there too, but, but in this case, it was the Germans. Uh, so we're still having these conversations, and obviously, we've seen what's happening at the federal level that you get ero the erosion. Each little thing is, well, is this emission worth tackling? Is this regulation necessary, et cetera? So, you know, I would say I still give it an eight. Um, and I give it an eight because of the political courage that was needed in uh, Alberta and in 
at, in Ottawa to kind of stand up and say, no, we can actually take advantage of this. I think where we're missing to get to the 10 is that we've forgotten that what we're doing is really important, right? We've, the, the prime minister and his government, I think, have forgotten that the carbon price is still the key policy in the country. And every year it's getting a little bit higher and every year it's driving more change, but it's, it needs to be fed, it needs to be supported, it needs to be sort of in people's minds. It can't be, a, okay, well, that was a thing we did five years ago and now we're doing other things. And I think that happened in a way with Premier Notley as well, and it happened with Premier Kenny, that you know, maintaining that drive is important. Um, and so I think that's maybe where it's, it's not a 10. So anything you would change personally? Um, I probably, well, so I don't know if I told you this, I initially said no to doing, so connected to your initial opening, I initially said no to doing um, Premier Notley's policy. Uh, because I was scared of the blowback internally and externally um, on my life. I don't think I would have said that. I think I look back and I say I should have dug in more with both feet. I probably should have uh, done more in Ottawa at some points personally. Um, but I think in the communication side, I think I would have been maybe more direct on two things. More direct on our ability to rely on the carbon price and not a larger government response to say, I know what your emissions should be next year, and I know what Quebec's emissions should be, and I know what our electricity generation mix should look like. So I'd push harder on that, and I'd push way, way harder on the role of the rebate or the, the lump sum. You know, that was one that I took for granted as economists, that we would see that as just, you know, that goes into people's pockets, they can spend it on whatever they want, but that question of, well, doesn't that negate the effect of the carbon price? Isn't it just a wealth redistribution? I think I probably would have spent, you know, a whole, whole lot more time on that. Right. Um, there's a statement that you have in the book uh, that I found really interesting, which is that, um, you know, well, I'll summarize it. I won't quote it exactly. You have to remember that while we're dealing in matters of uh, uh, science and public policy, that this is really contested ground. Right. And I wonder if you could reflect on whether you think that the ground beneath the feet of the climate change debate has gotten more contested or more common in the period where you've been working, when you've been working on the files. Um, that's a great question. I think my sense, even despite what's going on in, um, in Ottawa and Edmonton right now, is far less contested in the sense that you know we've had three federal elections where in every case the party with the best climate policy has has won um, but we haven't had a federal election where a party has said we're not going to act on climate like they, they've said we're not going to act as aggressively we're going to act differently we're going to act more aggressively um, and then i look back in alberta and i say you know think of what our premier is saying right now she's not saying we don't need to act on climate change she's saying we're going to be net zero by 2050. This is a premier of Alberta out here saying, we're gonna be net zero by 2050, showing up at the Pemina conference and bragging about it. So compare it to, you know, even Premier Kenny's regime when it was like, you know, we're gonna send the environmentalists to Siberia. Prime, literally, he gave a speech in Fort McMurray saying, you know, there are no protests in Russia and you gotta wonder, ask that. yourself why. Um, so he literally said, um, we should send the environmentalists to Siberia. And he wouldn't engage, he told the oil companies like, I, ex I, for, I saw one of his first speeches and he said, essentially, Pembina is the enemy, right? He went after the environmentalists aggressively. Daniel Smith gave three speeches last week. One was to the Renewable Energy Association, one was to the Pembina Institute, and in both of them, she talked about a 2050 target, the necessity of reducing emissions, funding carbon capture and storage. So I think it's, you know, the arguments that we're having have gotten way smaller, right? If the, if the gap between, da even if you say Daniel Smith's world is net, lower by 2050 and Justin Trudeau's world is net zero by 2050 and Stephen Gilbo's is net zero before 2035. It's like we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. We're having an argument about pace. So I'm going to push you a little bit on yeah. that because uh, you know I differ a little bit on it. it has, the, um, has the disagreement become smaller or has it become less public? Has it become unacceptable to campaign on, well, we're really not going to do anything about climate change? Uh, and therefore, uh, everybody contesting public office has to fake it better. I mean, I think that's, that's certainly part of it. I think people are 
faking it. And I think we see on on maybe on both sides an unwillingness. I mean, I talk about the just transition stuff in the, in the book, an unwillingness still to grapple with the truth in some cases on this right that you know if we're going to get out of the business of producing oil and gas there isn't going to be a miraculous new industry that take hold, takes hold in Fort McMurray yes and or almost certainly isn't and so if you can't wrestle with that it's you're in some ways doing you know maybe not quite the same thing but you're having the not quite the full conversation with yourself I think you know I talk about the oil industry and I think that's probably where you're seeing I don't, uh, but I don't think it's disagreement as much as it's like a self-interested forecast. You talked about LNG in your yeah. um, in your mailer a couple of weeks ago, and you know this idea that well, of course, the oil and gas industry is you know thinking that oil demand is going to be larger, but but when the oil and gas industry is coming out and saying like you know their forecasts are dropping and are saying, you know, feeling the need to say, well, yeah, we acknowledge that this is not consistent with global goals. They're actually being forced into that in a way that probably wasn't there even in 2015, right? There were just, there is more, there's another piece to the conversation. They know it just isn't enough to kind of scoff at it and send it away. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that there's an increasingly stringent forcing mechanism in markets. And you see, you see that, I mean, this is what I do for a living now, as you know, advise investors and uh, largely private sector actors on the energy transition. And you see it even in, you, I think you paint a vivid picture of this in the book, that you see it even in the, the CapEx decisions that oil companies are making, i.e. they're not really investing in the future of oil anymore. They're investing no in um, share buybacks and uh, um, increases in dividends because that keeps their quarterly, their annual investment flow going. So. You know, I think there's a um, there's a really rich discussion to be had about the the policy choices that we've made, and this is not a partisan point. All parties have made them. I think it would shock most people in this room to learn, for instance, that uh, we've per we've increased our oil output this century by about 250 percent, right, in this country, and in Can in the United States, it's more than tripled. Yeah. So I'm not sure how many people actually knew that in this room, that in 2000, we produced about 2 million barrels of oil a day, and this year we'll produce five, yep. right? And those are not by accident, by the way. And I, I, I think that this is, um, if I could quibble with Chris a little bit, and the piece that he wrote in, in The Globe about this topic, that you can't, you can't see these um, developments as stable objects, right? That, we are at a point in the trajectory of the development of this issue, and that is in particular true. Uh, I came to McGill with the ambition of being a physics student and then found refuge in the arts department. So, um, but I still have a little bit of physics left in me. And, and I think about the, the dynamics of this, uh, the development of this issue. You know, it, they say in physics that the strong nuclear force is the most powerful force in the universe, and it's what holds atoms together. Uh, in politics, I think the most, uh, the strongest and un most underrated force in the universe is the inertial power of the status quo, right? Yeah. And that is not held together by some natural set of forces. It's as Upton Sinclair famously said, it's amazing what a man can believe if his salary depends on him believing it. Uh, it is the commercial interests of the people who benefit from the status quo that holds the status quo together. And it's only when something, an exogenous force that's powerful enough to overwhelm that uh, um, stable equilibrium comes along yeah. that it happens. And we're clearly there with, well, I don't know if we're clearly there. We found a force that's powerful enough to overwhelm the status quo in our energy economy, and that's climate change. Mm. The question is, how quickly will we do it? Who will be the winners and losers at the end of it? And are you hopeful that we're coming to terms with that bigger picture question. I think so. Uh, you know, I was, I was thinking as, as you were talking about, you know, it, to me it's almost the political conversations that we can't find, in, like we're still having the political conversations about pipelines and project yeah. approvals and all of these sorts of things. And, and I talk about this a lot. Uh, a friend of mine spoke in my class quite a bit, Alfred Sorensen permitted the first LNG project off Western Canada. Um, in Kitimat. So not the LNG Canada project was being built right now, but it was uh, called Galveston LNG was his company right. at the time. That project still has all its permits in hand. It has a fully permitted pipeline owned by Enbridge. 
nothing. There's a, like an industrial dock and that's it. So, you know, for 10 years now or 15 years, we've been having this conversation, but like the world wants our oil and gas, but not one Calgary company would step up and put their money behind that project. Yeah. No one would sign a long-term offtake agreement to ship their gas out to that project. So we're still having these conversations. You know, we're having conversations about an oil sands mine. So like somehow in, you know, somebody's mind, tech would have built the frontier mine, right? Tech currently is a part owner of the Fort Hills mine, which is a pretty well an unmitigated disaster so far. And it's a project that only breaks even if you get, like it only makes a reasonable return on investment if you get like 80 plus dollar oil for the next 50 years. They're not willing to make that bet. Mm -hmm. But the only person talking about it is like the premier of Alberta, as though that if the, the federal government just get out of the way, um, this project would get built. Ignoring the fact that there are like literally dozens of better oil sands projects sitting with all their permits today that somebody could start building and they're not doing it. So it's almost to me like we, we're lacking a creative political conversation yeah. to have, right? And we're, we're labeling it differently. We're calling it gatekeepers now or whatever. <laughs> but we're, we're having that same conversation that somehow, you know, but for the interventions of some evil person, we'd be back to that world. I was looking back, this is a longer answer, but um, I moved from Montreal to Alberta in 2006. And when I was going out to Montreal uh, to do a job talk at the business school at the University of Alberta, I'm like, I probably should know more than I do about the oil sands. And so I picked up the National Energy Board had just done a report on the future of the oil sands industry. And it was a 2006 update to a 2004 report. And in that, they're talking about 8 million barrels right. of oil, 8 million barrels a day of oil sands production by today with like a row of refinery upgraders all through Edmonton. It was going to be this massive industrial complex. It is a massive industrial complex. It's just half the size of what we would have predicted it, it was going to be. And, you know, you, you sort of see how much that world has changed. But our political conversation around it hasn't changed that much. Yeah. And I think that's maybe the, the challenge. Um, another one, I mentioned Jason Kenney like three times today, which is more than I usually mention him, but <laughs> he, um, he had this really interesting kind of two weeks in his, early in his premiership where he gave that speech in McMurray that I mentioned to an oil sands conference about sending the protesters to Siberia. And then he gave a speech in, I think it was in Calgary. And then he went on a tour and he went Toronto, New York, London. And it was very interesting to see, like, the J I talk a lot, I joke about the Jasons Kenneth, the multiple personalities of Jason Kenny, but he was a completely different human on this file from the time he left Fort McMurray to the time he returned from London. And, you know, because all of his lines on this and the, the, the view of the future and the political conversation hit like a lead balloon. And he came back and he, you know, he redid the carbon pricing regime, but he actually, like, solidified the coal phase out. He didn't you know, provide these large subsidies to the oil sands. He didn't do things that maybe people would have expected him to do because he saw how much the conversation changed. I, I think he saw how much the conversation changed outside of the province. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I think back, you know, I got involved in politics because I was very concerned about, I was living in Ontario. I grew up in Nova Scotia, um, Cape Breton Island. Went to McGill, moved to Toronto. It's a familiar story. <laughs> and... Uh, I was I was really concerned of what the provincial government at the time was doing to public schools because I'm one of those. My dad was a coal miner, grew up in a coal mining town. I would not have had the opportunity to go to McGill uh, in just about any other uh, country in the world. You know the equivalent of McGill. Um, so I really got involved in politics because of education, and then. I met this guy, Dalton McGinty, who does not get enough credit for being a pioneer on climate change in the country. And I don't think this is a coincidence. He was the first premier of Ontario uh, who had a science background. He studied science in university. And I remember talking to him about this topic in, I don't know, 2000, 2001. And he said, think forward 25 years from now. Do you think this is going to be a bigger issue or a smaller issue? And no matter what kind of crap we take in for acting too soon on it, and we were talking about coal retirement, and Ontario still the only uh, was the first jurisdiction to voluntarily retire coal at scale, 7,500 megawatts. Um, he saw because he, I, I hesitate to even use this term because I really hate it. When people say, I believe the science, 
It doesn't matter whether you believe the science. The science is the science. It's either happening or it, it's not. That's what makes it science, right? Yeah. Um, but he, he would say if you, if you acknowledge the science, then you have to believe at some point we as a species are going to have to reckon with this issue. And we can put it off as long as we want. The more we put it off, the costlier it gets. That's where the economists come in. Um, but I think what we've gone through is just a really painful reckoning. And it's more difficult in this country than it is in many because our, our self-image is at odds with what we actually do. Yeah, and I think there's, there's a timing issue too in this, right? That how did, how did the climate change, the, the global community and its action on climate change, and you flagged this for me in the book earlier, the one thing I hate. Yes. And you know, why do I hate it? I hate the uh, international kind of theatrics around setting emissions targets. And Canada, since the very beginning, has done this thing where we go off to an international meeting and we set major economic policy with like zero forethought, right? We're like, well, we're gonna do something and it's kind of like when you're buying a house and all of a sudden like things that should be massive become small and you're like well do i want to spend an extra however many tens of thousands of dollars and you just kind of sign it and so you know think of kyoto and what did what did we do we we did this whole national process around developing a target and we were going to do zero per, we were going to do basically 1990 emissions flat by 2008 to 2012 and then the instructions that went to the bargaining team as soon as they landed were just do better than the Americans. Um, and so we went from 0%, like 1990 flat, to 6% below 1990 as our target. 1990 flat was going to be the most significant environmental policy, at even based on what you knew at the time, right? It would have been the most significant environmental policy probably that we'd ever undertaken in Canada. Acid rain get close, but I think, I think you could make the case. But then between that, you know, 1997 Kyoto and the 2010 target, all of a sudden you get an oil sand, you get a gas boom and you get an oil sands boom. And so right from the beginning, you're sort of set off in a challenge that no other, I don't think, I think it's fair to say no other sort of G7 or G20 country essentially land, found a giant deposit of hydrocarbons that could bolster their economic uh, situation. Well, the U.S. kind of. The U.S. Well, yeah, show. I guess the U.S. is fair, but the U.S. as a share of the economy, no, right? It, it changes right. their geopolitics, it changes their energy security, but as a share yeah. of their economy and the ability, like you know, think of the exchange rate impacts of the oil sands sure, FDI, totally. yeah, right? That, that happened in the 2000s, and it just changed our our national makeup, and nobody else faced that, and so we have this like climate change target that's essentially an arbitrary thing against a real material tidal wave coming through our, our country. I don't think anyone else has faced that. And I think if maybe, you know, I came back to that prices versus quantities, right? If the timing would have been different, if we wouldn't have had that, you know, 1990 baseline discussion around Kyoto, but we could have framed it more around what are we actually prepared to do? Mm -hmm. What are we prepared to demand of our industry? Take it out of the, like, the quantity discussion and get to kind of where you got on uh, in, in Ottawa or we got in, in Alberta on what are the policies we're prepared to implement? Yeah. Then we have a different conversation. Yeah, and you said a bunch of stuff there that's worth exploring. How much, um, someone was gonna give me time si signals. So how much time do we have? 10. 10 minutes, okay, we've got just enough time to explore this. Uh, we'll solve all the problems to do with the growth of uh, our emissions, the oil and gas industry, and um, national unity in this last 10 minutes. Andrew. Easy. So if, or if you're up for it, yeah, this sure, will be the speed round. Um, you said a bunch of stuff there that I want to uh, kind of uh, get at, because I think it's really important, and in the spirit of your book, which is let's talk about some of the mythology of climate change and why it is mythology and not science. Here is my diagnosis one man's personal diagnosis, having worked in the public, private, and third sectors on climate change through that entire time period that you just described. It's worse. Not only did we make that commitment in Kyoto, and if it, I, I remember, believe it or not, giving an interview from the Copenhagen COP defending Stephen Harper when I was president of the World Wildlife Fund because he inherited two mutually contradictory policies. One was there were 50 of the smartest people in the federal government trying to figure out how we were going to ratify the Kyoto Accord and put in plan a place to implement it. And then 50 more of the smartest people in government were trying to figure out how we were 
going to make oil sands oil economical at 55 to 60 dollars a barrel yeah. and nobody at the top of the government ever put those two conversations together and it's a lot easier to have these conversations before people are making billions of dollars than afterward on top of that and this is the point i was making about the u.s the reason that we projected 8 million barrels a day in 2006, right? Because we didn't think about fracking. Was because we thought the United States was going to buy 6.5 yep. of those 8 million barrels a day. And then suddenly they only needed two. And that failure to be uh, honest with the Canadian public and direct, maybe it was a big picture truth that we didn't want to see, is in my view the primary, the prime mover, so to speak, of all of the, di the discordance in the debate in Canada, be because we are always looking for that villain, right? So there, there's another piece to that, though. Like today, we have the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. That's, I think, the I, is it fair to say the most significant climate policy around, no question if ever. Um, no question. But go back in time. Energy Policy Act of 2005. You're all familiar with it? Um, no. The U.S. Bedside reading. Yeah, exactly. Bush Sr. said, you know, they're faced with this big energy security problem. And they said, we're going to put basically the resources of the U.S. government behind converting our refinery fleet to be able to process oil sands crude. And so it wasn't just us saying, hey, look, there's a U.S. market. It was the U.S. market saying, you know, we're going to spend all the money to make sure that that oil sands reserve is sort of ours and that we're prepared yep. to use it. And it, it, so that was a pull in the same way as the IRA is, is pushing on renewables right now. Yeah, for sure. The, the United States went from treating uh, northern Alberta as a domestic supply of energy yep. to one that they were, at best, to put it diplomatically, lukewarm about having in their marketplace. Absolutely. And, and so that's the past. Here is the yep. future scenario that worries me because I think it exacerbates all of the very real problems that you aptly describe in detail and in a very accessible way. And you've done another great public service. And Ken, thank you for, uh, I'm sure it was mostly good editing that made Andrew's writing so communicated. Uh, but <laughs> I, I can tell you, I can, as an aside, I sent this book to Ken at 40,000 words. Oh my God. And it came back a very short number of days later, almost unrecognizable at 32,000 words. And so, yeah, it, it really is. Well, there's, there's a rule of thumb in writing, yeah. as you know, is you can always cut 10%. Yes, and send um, it to Ken White. And send it to Ken White. <laughs> so, so here's the future that I want you to react to, and maybe we'll get into this in some of the questions to the floor. I can see Chris Reagan gradually coming to the He's front. He's got a graph in his hand? Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I'm worried about. We produce about 5 million barrels a day, rounding error, give or take, uh, up from two. About... 55% of that goes to the United States, and about 60% of that is used to power American vehicles of one uh, shape or form. As we said, the Americans have tripled their own oil output, so they need less of ours than they have in the past. And we've seen in the past, when they need less of ours, they will take strategic, call it strategic, policy moves to gradually squeeze ours out as the incremental barrels in the stack like they will privilege American production as any country would over uh, Canadian production suddenly we're not so domestic anymore when they have so much of their own supply yep. so what happens if the EV adoption rate in the United States takes off like it has in Europe and in China how yeah. quickly does that pull forward all of the stranded asset and uh, uh, j unjust transition problems that you describe in the book and what do we do about it yeah, I think the Chris asked a question in Calgary about, and he was asking about carbon capture and storage and small modular reactors. And, right. and he said, I can't remember exactly what your words were, but sort of, are you a techno optimist? And he was asking around those technologies. But I, you know, the, and the answer that I gave and, and I've given in a couple of other talks is yes, but not about those technologies, right? And, and it's solar, wind, batteries, electrolyzers that are the ones where you're seeing these orders of magnitude changes um, and thus electric vehicles. And I think, you know, we haven't internalized how much cheap energy means for the global, cheap solar and wind energy means for the global demand for natural gas. I don't think we've internalized how much cheap batteries and electric vehicles changes the global demand for 
transportation fuels, right? We went from this is growing to this is peak to this is declining globally in a really big hurry. So I think everything that you highlighted is right. The question for me, and it affects the U.S. too, is what happens first? Is it the supply response? So that you're already seeing the global oil majors say, you know, and the shareholders saying, I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to take that bet. So did they collectively figure that out in a hurry? Or is it the demand side that kind of figures it out first? And I think it's, it's that price response I wrestle a lot with in the book that yeah. I think we spend way too much time saying, oh yeah, demand's peaked or quantities or whatever. But I think the real question is like, how much are people gonna be willing to pay for that marginal barrel? Um, and if that price drops too quickly, the, the scariest quote in the book for me is the Jason Nixon quote, yeah. right? And so if you, if you look in the oil chapter, the, all of our like $200 billion of environmental liability on the landscape and the oil sands is secured with like 30 billion or 30, what is it? No, I gotta remember the number. It's like a hundred and hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not a lot, it's pennies on the dollar. And they have a regime where when the, uh, if these assets get stranded, they're gonna go out and ask the companies for money when things get rough. But then things did get rough in COVID. And the minister said, well, we're not gonna ask them for money now. And he has this quote where he says, well, the math doesn't work if prices decline. And I think that's true for that, but I think it's, it's all of that for all of the things you mentioned. The, the assets are government budgets, right? If Alberta's government budget and the federal government budget yeah. gets hammered by it, the employment, the wages, et cetera, all of that comes together if prices decline. And I think that's, it's, it's the price more than the quantity that scares me. And we didn't even get a chance to get into the global dimensions of this. With, yeah, with, we probably will. Yeah. I'm going to let you... Excellent. Uh, y you can take some questions. Well, thank you very too. much, Andrew. Thanks again for all your work and effort and time. And thanks, Ken and Chris and the whole team here for putting us on. So yeah. the floor is yours, folks. There's a microphone partway up. There's a microphone right here, so we're going to where, where does Ken Dryden stand on these issues? Uh, tall. Yes. <laughs> I guess in all circumstances, he does. Who's going to be the first to the mic? Don't make me pick one of you oh, out. People are moving. There we go. Danielle's moving. Hi. Thank you very much for this discussion and this talk. I'm Daniel Bélan, the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, and I'm really pleased to have you here today to talk about this important topic. Look. I have to ask the question about heating oil, of course, uh, and, and the regional politics of it, because you talk a lot about, uh, about Alberta, but we have someone here who's <laughs> uh, Jerry Butts, who's originally from Nova Scotia, and the regional politics of this is interesting, and not just from an Alberta perspective, but also in Atlantic Canada or here in Quebec. So how do we address these you know, regional disparities and regional discontent over you know, carbon pricing and more generally over climate change mitigation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, Jerry's from Cape Breton. My family's all from Miramichi. My sister-in-law is the Liberal Party leader in New Brunswick. Um, so I'm not immune from this discussion uh, either. But I think, you know, that, that decision to remove the tax from heating oil is one of many where we've got into these conversations of, we're going to exempt this emission and this sector and this. So it's, it's not just heating oil, it's farm fuels, purple gas, barn heat, whatever you want to call it, that we've had these conversations over and over again. And it erodes the basic premise of carbon pricing and why economists like it is we don't want governments making those decisions. We want to step back and say a government's never going to be able to decide that you can bike to work and you can't or you need a car and you don't or your emissions in one region are more valuable than others. Um, so I really don't like governments getting in and picking and choosing. It undermines the whole system. But to me the fundamental miss and I mentioned it in answer to one of Jerry's questions here was the way it's talked about, if, if you're looking for a policy to help lower income Canadians, right? You do not subsidize fuel because fundamentally, the, you know, you look at the distribution and who spends money on fuel, the spending is lar larger house, the larger your fuel bill, right? The more other things that you have, your steam showers, your hot tub, your whatever the case may be, the larger is your fuel bill. And when we say we're removing the carbon price, we're giving a little bit to low income people generally and a lot to high income people. And so I think what was missed in that conversation, it was almost symptomatic 
of we haven't communicated the fact that truly the combination of a carbon price and a lump sum check that has some label that nobody understands, but a lump sum check is these probably along with the childcare program, the largest progress we've made on affordability issues in, um, in Canada. And I'll, I'll go back to conversations with Premier Notley, right? Progressives generally don't like energy taxes. They've always said, well, that's a regressive policy. And I remember the first conversation I had with Premier Notley about it. And I said, what if we could make it progressive? What if I could make it so that 70, 80% of Albertans would be made better off by this policy and 90 to 95% of people in the lowest, below median incomes would be made better off. That's what changed the conversation. I think that's also true federally, was Absolutely. that's the, what changed the conversation. And then we forgot about it, right? And so we have this question of, well, if you wanted to do something for affordability in Atlantic Canada, there are a bunch of things that are happening that are good. Heat pumps, rural rebates, et cetera. Sure, let's recognize that. but. If you think of the government saying we've got some resources we want to spend on something, then removing the carbon price is not a way to get to that affordability challenge. And I mean, politically, I think it just enforces what was exactly the argument that people have been incorrectly making right, about the carbon price, which is if you take that policy as a whole, you can't have one side of it without the other. If you said, if I remove that, fundamentally what happens? most people earning below median incomes in Canada are made worse off by that decision, full stop. And so if that's the road you want to go down, that's the implication. Next. Well, thank you for your extremely enlightening discussion. I'd like to return to the, to the questions that you posed in the featured chapter uh, about how Canada is going to respond to this climate crisis. Indeed, we should do as much as possible to reduce our personal consumption. But the question is, uh, the question that you pose, how Canada will respond, I believe should be framed in a, in a, in a different light, uh, uh, a light in which probably there is going to be a higher concentration of population on Canadian soil going forward, certainly in 2020, uh, 2100, if not 2060. In uh, light of uh, emerging carbon capture technologies, and, and some things that we probably don't think about, but the impact of uh, artificial intelligence on, on the, the way that we live, I would imagine that uh, much more of our c uh, civilization will be digitized at that point. Additionally, RNA technologies role uh, you know, we, we have relied on endogenous uh, evolution uh, for so long, but there's perhaps, a lot in here. <laughs> yeah, perhaps we will actually have the ability to evolve even faster, uh, or, or yeah, accelerate our evolution. And the, and the last ingredient, you know, you take these three together: a AI, um, you take the RNA technology, and, and finally the last, the puzzle, the fusion fusion technology, which really brings a, a new source of energy and uh, an enthralling now uh, ability to combine the three technologies to advance quickly, unrelentingly, without any concern for entropy. Oh, Can I? Uh, yes, I want to hear how, you, how you'd reframe sure. the discussion in the chapter in, in light of, of what I mentioned. Thank you. I, thanks for the, for the comment. And, you know, I think, especially when we talk about technologies like fusion, so I'm on a couple of fusion projects at, at U of A, um, but I think the timelines are just different. We, are, we need to solve this problem on a timeline that is, or we need to move forward in solving this problem on a timeline that fusion is not at. So the, the, you know, I would love for that to be the case, but we have a giant fusion reactor that is available to us right now to help us solve this problem. And I think we are making a lot more use of it, the sun, for those of you that didn't get the reference. Um, and it's so it, it, it's, 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 it's a safe distance away. Um, but I do think the one that you highlighted um, that I will pick up on is AI. And I think the way we can use AI to solve a lot of the problems, we talked about it in one of the other lectures about integrating renewable power into our systems, adapting our household loads, dealing with our EV charging uh, cycles and how we make use of the fact that not only will we have these electric vehicles on our grid, but we essentially we have 
you know, the distributed energy system of having all of those batteries all over the place. Where do they charge? Where do they discharge? How do we use them, et cetera? How do we put them into houses? How do we manage household loads? I think those are going to be small from a technical perspective. They're not hard. But when you think of the conversations that we're at right now and where our systems are at, I think small leaps can make a huge difference, opening up uh, consumers into being more active participants in electricity markets, et cetera. All of that stuff is super exciting. And it's, you know, a year away, not 40, 50, 60, whatever the years is away. I, I just add to that, Andrew, that uh, this is one of the biggest debates in climate circles now about whether one should be a techno optimist or pessimist. And my view is that, um, from a scientific perspective, Frank Wilczek, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, wrote that uh, every, there's, as Andrew said, there's only, we talk in terms of energy sources all the time, there's only one energy source, the sun, and everything else is an energy carrier or storage mechanism, whether it's oil and gas or um, a photovoltaic cell or mm -hmm. a pipeline. It's just a way of carrying energy that's been created by the sun. Um, and Frank, I'd never known this data, but I always take comfort in scientific data, that every day the planet is washed in enough solar energy uh, to satisfy 10,000 times the energy we use in a year. Mm -hmm. And when you look back on all of the miraculous and marvelous scientific advancements of the past 100 years, I just refuse to believe we're not going to figure out a better way to capture, transmit, and use that energy than what we found in um, dinosaurs, right? <laughs> I just, I, I, that's what makes me ultimately an optimist. But well, and we have gotten a lot better at it. We have right? gotten a lot better at it. That, you look at yeah. and how much cheaper it's become. You talk about this eloquently in the book. I really believe that. But the, the counter is, and this is what I work, I've become much more optimistic long term about climate change and much more pessimistic short term because there's a stock and flow problem here, right? There's about two trillion tons of little more uh, than two trillion tons of carbon in the atmosphere that shouldn't be there. It used to be in safe places like under uh, the ground and we've taken it from there, released it into the atmosphere and counted on the oceans to absorb it. So it used to be in a safe place, we put it in an unsafe place. And the timeline is, is really astonishing. Uh, two thirds, mm. uh, sorry, three quarters of that carbon has been put in the atmosphere since the negotiation of the Kyoto, Kyoto Accord. I like that in your email. You know, it's, good, uh, it's stunning, it right? 25 years. We, in the last, we think about this as, oh man, this has been a problem since the Industrial Revolution. Since we started becoming aware of the problem, we've made it three times as bad, <laughs> right? And the most pernicious uh, um, attribute of climate change causing emissions is that they persist for hundreds of years. So we've already baked enough into the atmosphere, and I use that uh, verb aptly, I think, uh, to cause problems that we have no institutional capacity to deal with over the next 30, 40 years. So as the parent of two teenagers, this is what I worry about. I think that what's coming is going to come faster and going to be harder to deal with than we have any capacity to absorb human migration, uh, Andrew talked about the, the one that worries me most, but also this climate change is going to present itself as a water problem, first and foremost, to people. There mm -hmm. is going to be too much of it in some places, too little of it in others, and in some really unlucky places, too much and too little in sequence. Um, so, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say, yeah. I believe in science's ability, to, you should be optimistic it, it, about science in the long-term horizon, but in the short-term as you say about fusion, yeah. it's just not there to solve the problem we it's have. The, it's the getting, yeah, getting stuff out of the atmosphere, not yeah. stopping us from putting it more in. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I just drained the clock there, Chris. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for injecting a sense of urgency because this really is fascinating stuff. I'm a baby boomer. The only thing that stopped the Vietnam War was people being informed and knowledgeable this is the basis of what we should start with. I'm going to start with our church. The Pope was saying it last week. I don't know about you, but every single day I wake up anxious about the world. I do not think that most of, I'm going to be dead, but most of us are not going to survive. Um, and it's, it's really scary. And politicians are simply not doing enough. Greta was right. We have to get the people 
out in the streets who really understand and are knowledgeable. And I'm sure you could get most of the McGill graduates out there. Every university, every church, every organization in Canada. And Canada could lead the world in this if you chose to. I've just come from the United States. I lived there for 50 years. I couldn't bear it any longer. You, I was, I'm hoping Wait that, till Canada, this time next year. that Canada, <laughs> and I'm a McGill graduate, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Cote. Uh, I work for the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. Thanks for the shout out. Um, being that uh, we're pretty concerned with the uh, moratorium going on in Alberta right now, I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about that. And do you think it's going to end after six months? Sure, great question. So, I mean, for those of you that aren't tuned in, essentially what happened in Alberta was we had a government, both the NDP and the uh, Conservative government, and a system operator and basically a kind of almost most of the research around our electricity system that was not that bullish on solar. And even if you asked me a year ago how much solar we're going to have in Alberta or two years ago, I would have said, eh, not that much. I said wind is where the, the, the action is going to be. But then what happened is the combination of an electricity market that says, we'll pay you for energy no matter when you show up, and a carbon pricing system that says, we're going to pay you for emissions reductions whenever you deliver them, made it economic for people to build more solar quickly than anybody could have imagined. So to give you a sense of how quickly this happened, in May of this year, so May 2023, the, our grid system operator released a study, said, what will happen if we get 2,000 megawatts of solar built by 2030? What will happen to our grid? Can we back it up? Can we handle the variability? The day they dropped that study, they had like 4,000 megawatts under construction. Today, they've got, I think, 14,000 megawatts in the queue. So the solar thing, there's my third graph with my hand. It just took off faster than I think anybody, even the biggest renewable energy advocates would have imagined, and everybody got flat-footed. So I think it's actually a nice metaphor for some of the stuff you've talked about, is that you know I used the Hemingway gradually then suddenly quote in the book, but I think that's how it happened. It caught everybody flat-footed. And so, yes, I mean, I think it's going to, I think they'll change something, but I mean, we saw today a massive acquisition in Alberta's market. So Alberta's market basically probably collapsed today. We now have two firms that control 80% of the dispatchable energy in the market. That is not a sustainable competitive market when you have two players that control an essential good. So I don't know which way it's gonna go, but we're gonna have a new market design. We're going to have probably different regulations. We're gonna have a whole bunch of new stuff, but the world now knows how cheap solar and wind are to generate. And that's the big thing that's come out of all this. And you know, the premier can sort of throw herself down in front of it and procure 6,000 megawatts of nuclear if she wants to, but that fundamental thing is not gonna change. Awesome. So thank you again for, for everything today. The talk's been really insightful. Um, so switching from extraction of oil to like extraction of lithium still keeps us in an extractive economy and can still harm the planet, which can lead to the same issue, just slower. So I'm wondering, is there a way Canada can thrive without a narrow focus on an extractive economy? Um, I think there is a big difference between extracting direct consumables versus extracting battery components. So the extraction of lithium is just at a completely different scale from when we're talking about you know, 5 million barrels a day of, of oil extraction and 100 million barrels a day of oil extraction globally. Um, I think battery technology, and you've written some on this as well, but battery technology, I don't know if you saw Toyota's announcement about the solid state batteries. I mean, what we're building batteries out of today, we probably will think is foolish in 10 years and how we're building them will think is foolish in 10 years. So I think our challenge is more, not how do we avoid being an extractive economy, but how do we avoid kind of this idea that we're gonna pick the winner and go after it like crazy because, I don't know, it's going to change. You might, we probably have stuff on this, but it's going to change dramatically. Yeah, and, and I, when I do my sort of stock energy transition presentation, I end it with this uh, advertisement from uh, Sears Roebuck catalog in, I think it was 1925, where they were selling um, washing machines that ran on gasoline. That actually happened. You can look it up. Yeah. And... Uh, Disruptive transitions like this cause all kinds of crazy things to happen. Uh, I think that we're going to discover battery technology on the same 
principles of physics that we talked about a few minutes ago that will make these batteries look really inefficient. Um, all of these problems that are allegedly problems like range anxiety and charging time, and that's going to get solved in the equivalent of a blink of an eye. You know, at the end of the day, the internal combustion engine is dead, and it's just a question of how long the fleet turnover takes. My view is it'll take a lot less time than people expect it to. Gradually, then suddenly? Yes. <laughs> and we're at the suddenly part. Yes, we're definitely yeah. at the suddenly part. Yeah. And Hi there. Yeah, my question is about emergency management. I come from BC, so it's really more about kind of response to major climate events. Um, I know in BC they're currently reworking on their Emergency Program Act. Um, it's been going through revisions for several years now, but obviously every time there's a major fire or a flood or some other disaster, it needs to be brought back and essentially reworked to include this. I guess just in your opinion, what should emergency management legislation and policy going forward encompass with regards to climate change? And is there really a way to do it when you have these random and increasingly um, damaging events? One of the things I've learned is don't have opinions on things you know next to nothing about. And I really, I, you know, I have a friend who ran the response to the Fort McMurray fire. I'd be cribbing on her a little bit, but I don't have the depth to answer that. You, yeah, you, I, I don't. I'm sorry. I yeah. don't either. Okay, thank I'm, you. I'm with Andrew on the general principle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, hello. Um, thank you for your, for your conversation. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the waves thinking about the world and thinking about Canada staying, like we're talking about AI and we're talking about several countries getting on these waves and competing. And I want to know, when it comes to innovation, and this has to do a little bit with a conversation that happened with Scotiabank's VP and chief economist, uh, Jean-François Perrault, he said, climate change provides a lot of opportunity for innovation. My question is, is Canada getting on this wave fast enough or is that ship already let, like gone, according to what you're seeing. I'd say no in, yeah, no full stop. Uh, I agree. I mean, we lack the essential ingredient for innovation in this country, which is a competitive private market uh, in most <laughs> um, major services and products. And we don't want to instigate that private market through policy. So we go through this ridiculous cycle where uh, private firms blame governments for lack of innovation in uh, the, uh, the market economy, the governments do everything they're told to do, like cut taxes and slash regulations and sign trade agreements, and our productivity has gotten worse. So, I mean, I, I think there's only one lever left to try, and that's a more competitive marketplace. Yeah, anybody that's used a mobile phone anywhere else in the <laughs> world but Canada can appreciate how well we're doing on the innovation side. These are the last two questions. Okay. No pressure. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about the uh, climate rebate. Um, polling of the carbon tax is low and increasingly decreasing uh, the number of Canadians who have a favorable impression of it. Uh, some of that can be linked to inflation, some of that can be linked to certain political messaging in recent times. The, the consensus am among academics and what you had shared with the data that you had shows that it can be something that is progressive. How do uh, the people in this room and people involved help bridge that communication gap of this isn't necessarily something that's going to increase cost of living full stop because of the way the rebate aid is structured? Yeah. I, I think basically, uh, you know, y your question is a good one, and the way you led is the answer, right? You say, is the carbon tax popular? Um, we don't say, is the carbon tax and rebate regime popular? And I remember when, you know, when we were do initially doing it in Alberta and some initial modeling was released, and this was my, like, my error in a way as, a, as an analyst, but it's worth talking about, Chris. I know you're nervous. But I had asked for three pieces of analysis to be done. Carbon tax alone and effectively assume that you light the money on fire. I just want to see what the impact of it is in isolation. Rebate alone, assume that you can get the money from wherever, and the three of them combined. Of course, the study that got leaked to the press was the one with carbon tax alone and you light the money on fire. But I think what we need to do is have more of that conversation of it as a complete 
policy, that it's a means to say, yes, we're going to allow substitution away from fossil fuels, but that essentially the emitters are funding those who are not. Uh, or, or those who are lower emitters. And the more we have that conversation, the better. I do think though the, the challenge that we've always had as economists is we don't communicate the idea that just because you get a check doesn't mean, it, in fact, it means exactly the opposite. It's not optimal for you to turn around and buy the stuff that just became more expensive. It's optimal for you to go and buy other things. And that's the conversation that we're really not having. We still tend to have it as, if you keep doing everything that you do the same way, you'll be better off. We forget the second part, which is if you actually change your behavior, you and everyone else, every single thing that you do will make you better off incrementally. Maybe that's not convincing. Uh, hi there. Password. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your work. Um, my question is, like. Um, so you talked about the economics changing really fast in Alberta with the solar panels and everything. Um, I wonder, like looking forward for the next decade at the federal level with the possibility of like a government change, like how much that po the political change could actually affect like the, traje the trajectories we're on. I don't think very much. I think our governments don't have the power to make that much water run uphill. And I talk about this a little bit, actually, I'm gonna pivot away from your question to the just transition chapter, because I think this is the place where we often see governments pretending they can do things they can't. And you know, if you, if you think about how people talk about, well, we could just create other industries, we can just do that. And my, my instinct is always, well, okay, do it. Like if you think you can do it and all you need is a like post-industrial resource town in the woods somewhere, we have lots of those, right? We have no shortage of them. Not where, that like, there's anything wrong with those. Not things. that there's anything wrong. In fact, quite the opposite, but do it there. And, I, and, and so I think you know, that same pause is there of how much can a government really stand in the way of, and I talked about those four technologies, right? Wind, solar, batteries, electrolyzers. Governments aren't gonna be able to stand in the way, and the more they do it, right, the more we're gonna pay a price internationally. If the cheapest energy in the world is one that we decide not to have in Canada, that's not going to last, right? The cheapest source of transportation is one that we just decide we don't want, then that's not going to last either. And I, and I think the technology globally, the fact that we're only 2% of the global market means it's really hard for us to create global scale things and it's hard for us to stand in the way of global scale change. I just, last word on it, I, I think that uh, Politics is going to have a diminishing impact on the development of climate as an issue. I really believe that. I think that it's been treated for the last 25 years like a political issue, but it's not really a political issue. It's an issue of physics and chemistry. And um, it will present itself to people in ineluctable ways uh, with increasing velocity over time. And that means the reaction function of political marketplaces will force the reckoning with it. Um, the, in the last election cycle in the United States, uh, the Democratic nominee for president said in Pennsylvania that it was his economic policy to transition the American economy away from fossil fuels. Had you told me that anyone, uh, had you told me that that would, ha that would happen even one electoral cycle before that, I would think you were quoting an episode of West Wing. Uh, and I, I just think Politicians are not prepared for how fast this is going to come, and it's coupled with a demographic change uh, worldwide. I promise this is the last point, Chris. Uh, when I was born a million years ago in the summer of 1971, there were 3.8 billion people on Earth. My kids have a 17-year-old 17, 17 and a soon-to-be 16-year-old. There are 3.5 billion people in their generation, and 90% of them were born in emerging markets. They are going to overwhelm this issue. And uh, politicians who don't get ahead of that are kidding themselves about their prospects for future success. Rumor has it that you know a few things about politics. So I guess <laughs> it's good to give you the last word. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that final comment from Jerry Butts brings the first part of tonight to a close. I want to thank Andrew Leach for a terrific talk, Ken White for publishing that book that's in your laps, Jerry Butts for a great conversation, and all of you for attending this inaugural McGill-Maxbell Lectures. I also want to thank again Mr. Tom Kearns for his vision and generosity without which we would uh, not be here tonight. Finally, an enormous thanks to two individuals who have been working with me over the past several months, 
to put all of this together in all three cities, and they are here tonight, V. Weston and Adriana Goretta are someplace back there. One final, final word. As you know, this is the first, this is the inaugural McGill Max Bell Lectures. Next fall, a year from now, almost exactly a year from now, we will be hosting the second annual uh, McGill Max Bell Lectures. So please watch this space, our website or something, social media, for an announcement early in the new year about the topic and uh, the lecturer for the 2024 lectures. Uh, interesting. Jerry, I didn't expect Jerry to say this, that what we need is a more competitive economy. He thinks it's right at the top, right at the top of the list. <laughs> more competitive economy, so that's good. Maybe that would be a good topic for next year. Um, now I invite you all to uh, let these two get to a drink and some snacks. You get to some drinks and some snacks, uh, and you might be able to get Andrew to sign your book. Merci beaucoup à tous, et j'ai hâte de discuter avec vous autour de vin de verre, rouge ou blanc. Merci.